next important type of uh, acute kidney injury that is cardiorenal syndrome. For all practical reasons, the type 1 cardiorenal syndrome is going to be the most important. Let us see the definition. Of what do you mean by cardiorenal syndrome? Remember the diseases of the kidney or the heart affecting each other. Which means the disease of the kidney affecting the heart or the disease of the heart affecting the kidney is what we call as cardiorenal syndrome. Based on the pathophysiology, there have been five different types of cardiorenal syndrome. But again, for all practical reasons, the type 1 cardiorenal syndrome is going to be the most important and most relevant in our clinical practice because it is something that can be treated much faster in your ICU. And they are going to present very, very acutely. So, as the name suggests, it is an acute cardiorenal syndrome, which means a patient who is having an acute decompensated heart failure or abrupt worsening in cardiac function or simply an ADHF developing an acute kidney injury. How common is it? So, we see that so commonly in ICs, right? ADHF causing acute kidney injury. That is cardiorenal syndrome type 1, acute cardiorenal syndrome. And who are at risk? Especially patients who are having diastolic dysfunction are going to have more risk of developing type 1 CRS compared to those patients with systolic uh, dysfunction. Remember, patients with systolic dysfunction are more likely to develop uh, CRS type 2 rather than CRS type 1. A patient with diastolic dysfunction only are going to develop CRS type 1 more often than not. Plus, at the same time, what is the main pathology? It is renal congestion. Whatever may be the type of CRS, the renal congestion, especially for type 1, type 2, the renal congestion is the main issue that results in the kidney injury. Especially in ADHF patients with diastolic dysfunction, the renal congestion is going to be very, very high. And coming to the second type, that is CRS type 2, it is called as chronic cardiorenal syndrome, which means chronic cardiac failure, that is congestive cardiac failure, simply, which results in the development of CKD, that is CRS type 2, a CCF resulting in CKD. Remember, incidence of CKD in heart failure is approximately 20 to 70 percentage. 20 to 70 percentage of patients with CCF will develop CKD. And the only way to treat these patients is to improve the cardiac function. That is the only way to prevent the CKD from developing or treating the CKD in the first place or slowing down the progression of CKD in these patients. So, as such, diuresis may play a role here because there will be some renal congestion. But overall, you cannot do anything acutely. But CRS type 1 is something that you can reverse acutely. That's why more importance is given for CRS type 1 in your textbooks. And what about cardiorenal syndrome type 3? It is called as acute renocardiac syndrome, which means an abrupt worsening of renal function. It's reverse, renocardiac. Abrupt worsening of renal function is going to result in acute cardiac dysfunction. For example, an acute kidney injury producing a flash pulmonary edema due to either uremia or due to severe hypertension. So, that could be a best example. And type 4 is chronic renocardiac syndrome where a patient who is having a chronic kidney disease will have a declining cardiac function that is because of uremia and many other reasons and cardiac hypertrophy because of uremia remodeling of the cardiac muscles and chronic hypertension itself can result in chronic hypertrophy which is very common in patients with CKD and or increased risk of adverse cardiovascular events. And how many ever times someone asks if they ask you what is the most common cause of death in patients with CKD, the mortality is always due to adverse cardiac events and thrombosis, MI and thrombosis. That is the reason for death in patients with CKD due to any cause. Okay, even if the CKD is due to diabetes, doesn't matter. CKD due to hypertension, doesn't matter. CKD due to ADPK, doesn't matter. The, risk, the death is actually due to your cardiovascular events only. And finally, you have the CRS type 5. It's called a secondary CRS where a systemic condition very often a condition that is producing SARS like uh, a sepsis for that matters can result in both cardiac as well as renal dysfunction which is understandable. So, sepsis or any other condition that produces SARS can produce cardiac depression as well as kidney dysfunction causing AK. So, that is CRS type 5. Again for all practical reasons from now on we are going to discuss only CRS type 1. What are the risk factors for developing CRS especially CRS type 1 elderly patients age more than 60 because the stiff heart the diastolic failure will be more and renal congestion will be more. Females, smaller heart relatively. So, diastolic function will be relatively higher. Baseline CKD or baseline heart failure. So, of course, understandable. And diastolic heart failure, as I mentioned, is going to have a higher risk compared to that of the systolic heart failure because the main pathology is congestion. The backward failure is more relevant compared to the forward failure. Forward failure will more often result in CRS type 2 and backward failure will more often result in CRS type 1. Diabetes mellitus. Of course, microvascular dysfunction, 
already the heart will be a little dysfunctional and risk of developing CRS is very high and the kidney also will be having some issues because of diabetes and BP being very high especially systolic blood pressure more than 160 it will increase the afterload and will increase the backward failure. Pathophysiology of CRS pretty simple number one always renal congestion renal congestion renal congestion so the therapeutic approach should be to relieve the renal congestion that's all but if you want to know the exact pathophysiology of heart failure we can say it in one way reduce cardiac output due to heart failure arterial underfilling will happen that will activate ras ras will activate adh production and at the same time underfilling can also activate sympathetic nerve system which can also increase the release of antidiuretic hormone and uh, the sympathetic nerve system activity that is increasing along with reduced cardiac output is going to reduce the renal perfusion angiotensin 2 also can reduce the renal perfusion and uh, over time you know like you are going to have increased renal sodium and water absorption that results in development of volume overload and uh, edema remember once again in patients with uh, cardiac failure and cardiorenal syndrome the urine sodium will be low and the phena is going to be usually less than one only the reason for that is as i told you any ras hyperactivated state your urine sodium will be low so classic examples of ras hyperactivated state number one chf second cirrhosis and third one is nephrotic syndrome even in sleep you need to say i think we have discussed about this enough in the endocrine section itself then how will you manage heart failure in ak in patients with crs type 1 as i told you the most important is going to be the decongestion decongesting therapeutic options are going to be the most important and uh, in that the most important first line therapy is going to be the diuretics remember standard treatment of adhf is fine so you're going to use vasodilators inotropic agents or even mechanical cardiac support like impella or iabp or ecmo support fine all these are fine but as such the treatment of ak in heart failure in patients who are having type 1 crs means you need to use diuretics you need to decongest first that is the most important therapy and there have been innumerable trials that considered the difference in outcomes between bolus diuresis versus continuous infusion of diuretics even though from the hindsight you might be thinking that continuous infusion will be superior but it's not they have found absolutely no difference in the final outcome that is mortality and the symptom relief as far as bolus versus continuous infusion of diuresis is concerned and the only thing that you need to know is whether you use continuous infusion or bolus doesn't matter you need to give intense diuresis you need to give high dose diuresis because in both renal failure and cardiac failure both together your dose requirement of diuresis will be very high the ceiling dose will be increasing two to three times so that is the reason why you need to give intense diuresis with high dose lasix or high dose loop diuretics which is going to reduce the symptom faster and it can improve the renal function also much better and second ultra filtration ultra filtration is a dialysis technique that's going to remove the volume out of the body so some studies initially thought that early ultra filtration at the time of initiating diuresis itself can uh, result in much better outcome but it's not in fact some studies have said that ultra filtration if you're doing early at the time of uh, initiating diuresis itself can actually worsen the renal function in fact they produce only similar symptomatic relief not much different okay so the trial that showed this is called as caras hf trial which means ultra filtration can be done if your volume overload is refractory to standard diuretic agents so then only you can use ultra filtrate early ultra filtrate has not got much benefit and aquaretics can be tried like tolvaptan remember tolvaptan is heterotoxic so don't use in patients with cirrhosis or uh, liver failure and of course only if hyponatremia you can use tolvaptan uh, which is going to increase the water excretion from the system that's how tolvaptan works v2 receptor antagonist and it's not going to be much beneficial in patients with cardiorenal syndrome but if the patient is having hyponatremia you can use tolvaptan and other options include vasodilators inotropes mechanical cardiac support like impella or ecmo as you need in patients with uh, acute decompensed heart failure and one more interesting thing that is coming up in the crs type 1 scenario is the use of hypertonic saline and diuretics together theoretically speaking it is advantageous like uh, if you give hypertonic saline it's going to remove a lot of fluid from the body by osmotic diuresis because hypertonic saline is an hyperosmolar substance plus to prevent the accumulation of sodium you can inject diuretics also loop diuretics which increases the uh, sodium excretion from the body so from the hindsight theoretically speaking it must be beneficial but trials are ongoing and the early reports are very very promising maybe after two years or three years you might be 
following this but currently not yet routinely recommended because the trials are still ongoing but early results have been extremely promising and low dose dopamine previously what we have been calling it as renal dose like dosage of 1 to 2.5 microgram per kilogram per minute absolutely no benefit and neseritin which is a bnp analog brain atrotic peptic analog again has no benefit as per the dose trial all right so what is the final take home point diuretics 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 number one because you have to reduce renal congestion number two if it fails go for ultra filtration plus or minus toll vapten if the patient is having acid hyponatremia but by itself toll vapten doesn't have much benefit and standard treatment as per as per the adh protocol in the future you can follow hyperonic saline plus diuretics once the trial results are available subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from prep ladder